Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as the teacher of teachers in the grand ancient tradition of the Vedanta. He has led numerous initiatives to cultivate and further interfaith harmony and dialogue. He trains teachers in the Arsha Vidya Gurukulam and has led and impacted the lives of hundreds of thousands of tribals and rural people through an AIM Seva initiative. I'm delighted to welcome Swami Dayanand Saraswati. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Swamiji, you have uh, trained hundreds of thousands of people impacted their lives in the rich tradition of the Vedanta. Um, the Vedanta has been seen as the cornerstone, as the origins of the Hindu heritage. Uh, and, and, and that Hindu heritage, while it survives in very fundamental and deep-rooted ways, uh, is also seen more visibly today uh, by its more extreme forms uh, and, and sort of, in a sense, publicly undermines its deep, tolerant, secular or whatever phrase you wish to use. Your guru, the great master, um, Swami Chinmayananda, was involved with the setting up of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, uh, which also is now perceived as an organization being much more, shall I say, dare I use the word, right-wing or extreme. What for you as a Vedantist is the fundamental philosophy of I inclusivity and the celebration of diversity? If you... Uh uh, look at what is uh, going on in this country for a long uh, period of time, for centuries. Uh, we, we have accommodated different uh, religious traditions. We didn't uh, interfere. And there have been, the Parsis have been there. We enjoy them, they enjoy us. Jews have been here. This is the only country where they were not persecuted. They themselves tell this in so many words. And uh, this, we have uh, these two other Abrahamic traditions like uh, Islam and, uh, and Christianity. And this has been a home for them also. Fundamentally, Hinduism is not tolerance, it is highly validating. The other forms of worship, other forms of prayer, they, the Hinduism validates. Therefore, we have no problem. Do you fundamentally believe that a person who has a different mental disposition, who has evolved in a different social context, uh, or a faith that evolved in a different historical reality, could work equally well, even though it doesn't subscribe to your worldview, to create a good, benign, caring human being equal to yourself? One can. One, uh, it all depends upon what is the very uh, content of that philosophy. To be a good human being, you don't need anything. You don't need religion. You don't need even God. You have to go by common sense. I don't like to get hurt and nobody else wants to get hurt. That's enough. And I don't want to be robbed, I don't want to be cheated, you don't want to be. I like to be compassionate. You, And uh, therefore you expect the same thing from me. And I have that knowledge that you expect the same thing what I expect of you. This is common sense. This is not educated by any missionary. I have this knowledge. And that has got to be there because I have a faculty of choice. And therefore, I have to choose means I need to have a basis. The basis is very much with me. And as it is with you, then we have to go by this basis. And therefore, we can live in harmony. Why should I have a religion? Unless the religion has something to offer to me more than that. It is for that person the religion has something to add. 
and it should enhance. Because compassion, to be compassionate also, is to draw boundaries of threshold. And therefore you always feel I am compassionate, I am exploited. And for you to cross that, you require to be big. And I have something to tell me. My religion has something to tell me. My religion is anybody's religion. Something to tell me tells me I am limitless. I am the whole. If there is such a thing as limitless, it should include me. Not include me, it should be me. me. Because limitless cannot be made of parts. You're watching a conversation with uh, Swami Dan and Sarasati. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. मुझे एनएफएसएम की मदद याद है उससे हमारी दलहन की फसल भरपूर होगी एनएफएसएम दलहन की फसल के लिए सल्फर और दूसरे पोषक तत्वों पर 50 प्रतिशत तक की मदद और स्प्रिंकलर सेट लगाने के लिए भी पंद्रह हजार तक की मदद एनएफएसएम की मदद है सच्ची हर खेत के लिए अच्छी Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Swami Dan and Swaraswati. Why haven't we seen more social action uh, in, in, in our Hindu heritage? Because giving is the very crux of our religion. Danena Adanam Tara. Samaveda. Danena Adanam Tara. Your incapacity to give shows that you have not grown up. You are not mature, you are insecure. Therefore, you are grabbing. Your growth lies in your capacity to give. And therefore, how to, how to cultivate that capacity? By giving. India is the only country where people go and go anywhere without having anything. We had walked. I had walked the whole Himalayas and without having anything and I will find my food because every sixth mile, fourth mile I have a chowl tree, the chatti in the Himalayas in, in the whole, whole south you have got chowl trees, shatra and there is food, endowments are there, every village has endowment dhanena, adhanam, tara all the temples that, that are there they all, they all came up by Dhanam. Even today, any place you go, Dhanam is a big thing. Shraddhaya Deyam, Ashraddhaya Deyam, Shriya Deyam, Khriya Deyam. Just to tell you that I am not simply saying. So you have to give with Shraddha. Shraddha means knowingly. This is I am giving, but this is what I am giving. I am giving this for this purpose. And make that person, the receiving person, feel blessed that he was able to receive from you. And you, the giver, always should feel that you had the opportunity to give. This is our giving. No strings attached. Dhatavyam iti yad dhanam. What is to be given is to be given. You have it, the other person needs it, give it. Forget about it. You know, you have conducted uh, courses for uh, uh, you know, people who are in management. And before we started recording this interview, we were talking about uh, sport and, and the aspect of competition. Yeah. So how do you reconcile a, f uh, uh, a philosophy of competition which has in built into it elements of uh, aggression, uh, elements of being coming out in some ways superior to someone else, uh, and, and values that do not traditionally, to my limited understanding, and I assure you I'm not prompted, uh, is that uh, wh what is the impulse then? How do you re reconcile being competitive to also being the one with everybody and, 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 and experiencing the interdependence and the interconnectedness that uh, most traditions recommend. There is a, a, an inbuilt competitive 
bear it in everybody because there is a, an instinct for survival. Animals have it and plants and trees have the same instinctual that that commitment to survive. And uh, you can find this, you can keep it at a minimum level. In our society, we had nil competition. Father was a priest, son was a priest. There was no problem at all. Before the child is born, we all know what the child is going to do. That is zero competition. And now we have been ushered into a competitive world and inevitably, and I don't say it is wrong, it is right. This is the reality. And in this reality, what is very important is we follow rules. Whose rules? Divine? No. Uh, you know, the, we can, divine rules must be taken. Divine rules for us, dharma, is already a manifest form in your head, in the human head. There is this choice, the faculty of choice. In the same head, there is the matrix of values. And that is divine, you may call it. I say it is dharma. It is a manifestation of Ishwara. For this, this dharma is not a mandate of God. That is where the problem lies. Dhar dharma is God. That is why we look upon Rama as dharma. Ramaha vigrahavan dharmaha. There is a definition. Dharma gains a body, hands and legs. That is Rama. And therefore, for us, dharma is Ishwara. Don't go against Ishwara for God's sake. That is why I am saying that religions, religion cannot propound anything that will go against dharma. No religion should do that. For God's sake, you cannot go against dharma because dharma is not a manifestation of God. Therefore, for God's sake, you can go against dharma. In other words, do you know what it is? Yen justifies the means. I can use deception, I can lose, I can use anything, any means in order to promote God, my God. So then how would you reconcile, therefore, uh, therefore how do you understand <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi's means and ends? Yeah, yen, yen is the means. Let me finish this competition and therefore, you can compete, follow dharma, and that dharma is there, then again, there is a certain national dharma of paying taxes, etc. That they all, they are all uh, subheads of the universal dharma. Because, so you, you pay your taxes, you, you do what are, what are your dues to the society also, and therefore it's important that your happiness, it depends entirely upon the environmental. So, you see, I mean safety and there are people who are there, happiness, they're, they should be happy. Therefore, daily prayer is Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina. May all be happy. Then only you can be happy. You cannot be happy when all others are, all others are you know, crying. So, because there is empathy, no human heart is without empathy. I was just asking you about Mahatma Gandhi yeah. and his emphasis on the means and saying that the means are as important, if not more important than the ends. So, in, 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 in that context, how do you view the Mahatma I say, This is what I say. What he said is exactly what, what our Shastra says, what we say, what Veda says. So, means is the only end. There is the means, that is why we put, one thing I would like to tell you. You know, we categorically bring all our ends, human ends. <coughs> human ends like artha, security. And money, wealth, name, power, all this security. Then you have forms of pleasure, 
various forms of pleasure. One is called Artha, the other is called Kama. These are called Purusharthas. Common and sought after by people. But then they put before these two ends, Dharma as first end, but not as a subserving principle in your pursuit of Artha and Kama. No. Dharma itself is an end because we recognize the tendency to cut corners, sometimes go to go diagonally against Dharma in as much as there is pressure released from Kama, desire. So the desire driven person, highly driven, so would bulldoze his or her way in order to achieve the end because the end becomes the most important and the means can be anything. So in the absence of desire, yeah. what then is the impetus for action? No, in, Even they, if it is desire to help other people, the desire to serve other people, the desire to attain union with Ishvara, or whatever the goals of your tradition are, Desire is implicit. It is in the nature or the kinds of desire, surely, that the problem or the challenge arises. Desires can be anything. You can have more desires. The problem is that also Lord Krishna in the Gita says, I am in the form of dharma. I am in the form of dharma in everybody's head, in human heads. So, because it's a given, that capacity to desire is given to me. And I have no say over desires also. So, it follows certain order, psychological order. But surely as a monk, as a Swami, that you have prioritized your desires. Yeah, not, not in the occurrence of the desire. In my pursuit of desire, I have, I have priorities. I don't say, say this desire should not come, that desire should not come, that is, that is against an order, that is, that is creating problems for yourself. Nobody goes after a fancy. You decide what you want to go after. After some time maybe those desires also won't come. Do you still have desires that you feel you must not act upon? You know, you, you, there is a time when you grow out of. If you reach my age, you will definitely grow out of. <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, so what I say, so these desires occur, you, you, you follow certain desires. We don't advise don't have desires. We advise make sure whatever that you do to fulfill your desire doesn't hurt dharma. Dharma aviruddha kamosmi. Lord Krishna says in Gita, I am in the form of desire which doesn't go against dharma. Desire means desire prompted pursuit. As one who believes in uh, um, Ishvara, you know, the creator God, and you know the, the the notion of karma, how do the two coexist? Uh, and so, why is there human suffering if the human experience or our experience of the human experience of suffering is because of our karma and our actions? Then, what is Ishvara doing in the meantime? Ishvara is karma. Shura, karma is also Ishvara. Let us put it that way, because. Dharma is Ishwara. It's a manifestation. That's why the concept of Ishwara, the vision of Ishwara must be proper. Dharma is Ishwara. The other side of the coin of Dharma is Karma. Because, so dharma, dharma, karma means the Adrishta, Punya and Papa. You, somebody who has got some muscle power and gets away with a crime, and uh, then there should be a law 
he is going against the dharma that law should should get him and he should be caught that person should be caught by the law the local law may be may be you know hands of law may, may not be long enough to catch him but the law of dharma should be able to catch him and it it is automatic it is it is credited this fellow did something good credited something wrong debited to so no room for compassion There in that no, spirit no what compassion is law so what compassion this is no see so the law when, when the you act compassionately and you reach out to somebody there is punya that is adrishta that is called karma credited to your account which will translate itself into a comfortable situation either in this life later papa is the opposite and therefore what somebody is somebody exploit somebody's weak situation and that is a wrong action and should not, uh, that that person doesn't get away with so what you're really saying is that it uh, karma is an impersonal law of causality and 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 while ishvara is karma and and karma is ishvara and ishvara is dharma and and and, and because ishvara is all pervading but what is all pervading doesn't implicitly have a quality of compassion no why do you say that compassion itself is ishvara see why do we say that we don't because i see because i see extremes of uh, you know human suffering and uh, and it is possible according to you know this world view that they are consequences of the actions of people and i just wonder i said that is there compassion in the universe that though mistakes have been made errors have been performed no, not at all. that there will still It be unequivocal suffering no, the individual has suffering suffering means this word suffering also i have got uh, some problem what kind of suffering we are talking about is it emotional suffering or physical suffering what do you think physical somebody is suffering and that somebody seems to be okay therefore what i say i'm just talking about my own experience of suffering uh, that's when suffering. i experience pain uh, when i experience confusion that, when i experience the pain of someone i'm unable to help because of my limitations uh when i suffer because no doubt the cause of my actions and i just say i mean is there a compassion that can help me rise above this and it doesn't seem forthcoming so i wonder what ishwara is doing in his heavens we we don't talk like that see here this heaven business is not there with us this compassion you talk about is with you that is ishwara and i can't find it yeah no i'm not, not saying it isn't with that, me therefore, i lack the capacity no, therefore, in my failing and 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 you know uh, this is the question of semantics whether we're talking about heaven because it's part of the english vocabulary but the issue is that when i experience suffering and i experience you know we can quibble about whether this is suffering or it is pain or it is delusion or you know there are a whole range of words around it but the point is you want to call it discomfort the human predicament the human situation whatever words you want to use i mean i know you no no i understand what you say <laughs> let me so. answer this <laughs> see this emotional pain can be neutralized this pain is due to there is compassion because of compassion there is this pain also empathize with others and you cannot bring any redress to the earth. others and therefore you find that you have more pain or equally as in equal pain as the other person has you seem to experience the same thing which is which is given it is given it is not something specially to a given person every human being has this sympathy and therefore it's given afterwards the person goes about justifying the the person's actions response etc but the empathy is common to all what would you say just rephrase that question is that you know say victims of natural disasters 
children, victims of war, uh, and, and, and say that where is this coming from? And, and while a, a cold, impersonal philosophy of karma and causality See, will explain say, it. If you say personal philosophy, let us no, say. No, impersonal. Again. No, no, let us say uh -huh. there is one God. Uh -huh. He is doing this. No. Why isn't he intervening? No, why he, that's what I say. Why, why, why he doesn't intervene? You ask me that question. Why he doesn't intervene? Why? Because he cannot intervene. Because it's a, he's, there, there is no one single person sitting there with a silver beard and then uh, he is controlling everything with some computers. We are talking of what is here is Ishwara, this is how it is. What is is the question. Why is not the question. What is happening is the reality. And therefore this is how it is. And therefore in this you have been given, you are given a, a capacity to be a Swami, a master of your own emotions. Including that any, six any month one baby? Thing. No, you, your own emotions, I said. You can the, the suffering of that six month baby uh, brutalized by war. Yeah, that's right. How do we explain that? How, How do we, we understand to, that in our cosmology? No, the, in our cosmology, we should include that person also, why that person does it, what makes the person. There is a person at the top. You know, you're suggesting that I may have the capacity to do something about it and to climb out of it through my devotion or understanding of dharma or falling at the feet of you, a master. No, no, you have what, is the, what, what do we feel for that baby? No, no, that not only baby. Tell me about I the baby so I can understand it. <laughs> I'm limited, you know, not very bright. In fact, <laughs> baby doesn't suffer that much, I'm telling. Uh -huh. as, as a grown-up adult, uh -huh. adult suffers. Suffering uh -huh. more is more acute. Uh -huh. Go to the acute. What I say, this is happening, why? We have to analyze. This is happening, why? This is, this is also there in this, in this what is. And then why this is happening? There is a certain collective consciousness which makes a decision to wage war. And that has to be corrected. We have to correct. It is abuse of will. I am telling you, if it is war, it is abuse of will. If it is natural calamity, it is some readjustment that is taking place and therefore so some people will say it's karma, some people will say these are all different words we can have and somebody will say very safely that is the mystery of God. And so therefore, Swamiji, you know, help us uh, understand uh, as we sort of conclude this program, uh, help us briefly understand um, what you feel. You have been active in so many areas. You have intervened through your uh, AIM Seva program to impact the lives of uh, you know, uh, uh, so many tribals, 400,000 plus is the figure that you have. Give us a creed that is easily comprehensible uh, you know, across religions, across traditions, across faiths. Uh, as I describe myself, say, as a Hindu Buddhist, uh, maybe to the discomfiture of uh, some strands of Hinduism, um, what is, 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 is a universal creed, regardless of whether we believe in the dharma or not, is formally consecrated by Hindu masters? What we say aim for seva is caring. For, you care for people who need care. Everyone is born a consumer and continues to be a consumer. But then there should be Yet, a, a certain age, from, from that age one should be able to be a contributor also. And when, when you become a contributor, you have gained adulthood. Then the more you contribute, I would say there is better growth. The most mature person is one who contributes the maximum and consumes the minimum. This is, this doesn't require 
any religion doesn't require any kind of a, a commitment to one type of God or anything. This is very simple. I am born a consumer and I continue to be a consumer. But at one stage in my life, I begin contributing. If I keep growing, I'll be contributing more. And therefore, the maximum contributor and the minimum consumer is a person to be reckoned in the society. Thank you, Swamiji, and for yeah. the many contributions Thank that you, you make to our <laughs> insight and understanding into the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.